Uh, welcome everybody to this SD Access troubleshooting the fabric session. For, to introduce myself, my name is Michel Peters. I'm a technical lead within engineering. I'm currently working in the enterprise networking SDA solution escalation team. We support the SDA access solution from the BU side. So any issues that come in, they get reported to TAC, they come to us, and that we have to investigate them. Today we'll be talking about troubleshooting the fabric itself. The objective of the session is mostly to go more into detail into the fabric itself, to the components that we use inside the fabric, the technologies that have been built to use the solution. We'll also look at some CLI outputs to see what exactly is going on on the device side. We won't be using the DNA center for this specific session because the focus is purely on the fabric side of the device side of the things. So we'll be going over the technologies. I got some slides with some outputs as well. It might be quite difficult to see on the presentation, so I got my own laptop as well connected to my lab. So you get the presentations with the CLI outputs, but I'll also show them on the other screen that hopefully should be more visible that you can see the same outputs. But you'll have them in the slides as well for the references. So the agenda for today, first we'll be looking at the fabric itself. What is the fabric? What components are we using in the fabric? What technologies we deploy inside of it? Then we'll look at layer 3 forwarding, how a layer 3 packet travels to the fabric. We also have a layer 2 overlay, layer 2 forwarding throughout the fabric. Then we'll look at authentication, which is also a key part of the SD access solution. The secure fabric, how we can enforce traffic to make sure that it's secure and doesn't go from an unauthorized host to an authorized host. And then at the end, hopefully, we'll have some time for questions. And then that's it. So first, to look at the fabric itself. So this is a diagram of a really straightforward fabric. Two edge devices with some PCs connected to it. One control plane node, the control plane node is the intelligence of the fabric. It maintains the databases. It knows who's located where and can direct the traffic flows throughout the fabric. We have a fabric a border host as well. It's connecting to the outside of the world. For the fabric, every time you go outside the fabric itself, you need a border. You can either go to an internal border if you go to a part of your network that might not be a fabric. You might go to another fabric. You might go to the internet. That's all being connected to the border. Even if you have two virtual networks being deployed, inside your network, if they want to talk to each other, they need to go via the border to be able to have external connectivity to each other. So the border is quite crucial to the network, and we have multiple types that you can deploy. The edge devices, I just drawn two here, but you can have multiple there. You can have hundreds, thousands of devices inside the fabric, depending on your needs and the topology of the network. The underlay is also quite important inside the network. The underlay is where your infrastructure is, your devices, they all connect to it, the fabric edge devices, the control plane nodes, the border nodes, they all need IP connectivity to each other. That's being done through the underlay network, where traditional networking, you would also have there your IP host. What we have inside the SD access solution, we only have there the infrastructure devices. We tunnel the traffic via overlay networks between edges, between the edge and the border nodes. So the underlay network is really clean. It should have only connectivity for networking devices. You need reachability, of course, to your eyes, to your DNA center to be able to get the configuration pushed. But there's no end host connectivity inside the underlay network. That keeps the underlay network easier to manage. The tables inside the underlay network should be smaller. Most migrations, most churn in the network, they occur because of endpoints coming into the network. Because we put them into the overlay network, the underlay network itself should be quite manageable. So once you get the underlay working, it's pure IP connectivity. We recommend using a layer three topology for the underlay network. That's because we use internally, we use a lot of SVIs to push out via the edge devices, but we want to keep them downwards towards the endpoints and not coming them back up into the underlay network. So if you have a layer three topology on top of that, we can start being, building a virtual network, either one, two, three, four. Depends on what you need, how many overlay networks you want to put on top of that underlay network. So the virtual networks is where your clients are located. They connect to the virtual network through the fabric, through the underlay network. They get that traffic tunnel towards the border, towards each other, towards the servers, depending on what they need to be connected to. Once you deploy the underlay network, it doesn't matter if you add VNs, if you remove VNs. The underlay network is not aware of what you do inside the overlay networks. The underlay just remains stable. All it knows about is the Slash 32 is from all the various edge devices. It can route there. It knows how to reach all the fabric devices, but it's unaware of what happens on top of things. 
So some key technologies that we use inside T-Fabric. The first one is LISP, the Locator ID Separation Protocol. The protocol has been around in networking for quite some time. Originally, it's been used a lot by the service providers to be able to get, especially like redundant connections for specific clients. We started using it inside the, the fabric as well to be able to let us do the way that we want to do the fabric. How it's going to work, we're going to look later at that. Cisco TrustSec is the security solution that we have. It's, always, it's been around already for a while inside the campus environment. We didn't have much adoption for it, but what CTS will give us is that we can deploy policies based upon a group instead of on an IP address. Traditionally, you had to build your access list, that specific host, that specific server. You have to maintain everything, but with CTS, we just link an IP address using authentication to a specific group, and with that specific group, we can just apply policy saying from group A to group B, this protocols might be permitted, this might not be permitted. We also use authentication. Obviously, if you have a lot of clients that need to connect to the network, as the access is going to give you a lot of flexibility. But for flexibility, we also need to know who connects where. For that, we use ICE or any radius server. The radius server will get the authentication results from either .1x or you can use map authentication bypass or map if you have devices like printers, cameras, and things like that. ICE can either profile them or you can configure them into a specific IP pool. By allowing ICE to direct the traffic, we can assign the various endpoints to their specific virtual network, to the specific pools, and provide them with the network access that they need to get. VXLAN, that's also a topology uh, protocol that we use. It's the data plane protocol. Inside the fabric, we encapsulate all our data inside VXLAN. We'll look at that later as well, why we use it. We don't use the entire VXLAN protocol. We just use the encapsulation to be able to go from edge to edge or from edge to border or from border to edge. So to look at LISP, the basic operation from LISP is that it decouples the location where somebody is, its IP address, to where he is in the network. Traditionally, if you have an IP address, it belongs to a subnet, and that subnet is on a specific location behind a specific device. By using LISP, they decouple that. We have one address space, which is the endpoint identifiers, and we have an R lock space, which is the routing locator environment. With LISP, we make a coupling between this endpoint is located behind this R lock. The only thing, if you want to move the client from A to B, we don't need to move the entire configuration of the SVIs. We can just move the R lock information on the database, and instead of he's located behind R lock A, he's now going to be located behind R lock 3. So that makes it easier to migrate things and also removes the dependency of the location where you are with your IP addresses. And we'll look at how that works in some later slides as well. So some key uh, components that we have inside LISP. First is the ETR, the egress tunnel router, and the proxy ETR that de-encapsulates the traffic coming from the fabric, encapsulated with VXLAN traffic, and sends it out in pure IP traffic towards the endpoints. It's also responsible for registering who's located where. It's an endpoint, the ETR functionality to say, OK, I learned endpoint X is behind me now and needs to register with the control plane. You also have the ITR, the ingress tunnel router. Obviously, if the client wants to send traffic, it comes in on an edge switch or on the border node. It needs to be encapsulated in LISP, and it's going to be sent onto the network. We also use the acronym XTR. That's when a device is both an ITR and an ETR. In SD access, typically all the devices will be an ITR and an ETR. Doesn't make much sense to only de-encapsulate traffic, only encapsulate traffic. We also have the MS the map server and the map resolver, those are the control plane nodes. They take care of the registration from the endpoints. They build a central database of all the IP addresses that we have in the network. The map server takes the registrations, builds the database, and the map resolver will answer any queries from the clients that come in on the network from other ETRs to know where, or ITRs, when they ask who's located where. We have the endpoint identifiers. That's the IP pools, the endpoints that you have. It's where your address space is, where your users are located. And you have your R-lock space, the routing locators. That's your fabric devices, your border nodes, your control plane nodes. Everything that belongs to the fabric itself, but that we need to have in the underlay network. So some quick mappings with regards to the different worlds that we have. We have the Cisco DNA Center using some acronyms. We have the switch side, and we have the LISP side. For example, if you look at a virtual network on Cisco DNA Center, on the switch side, we define a VRF. So if you look at the configuration of the switch, you will get a VRF 
with the name of the virtual network. And on the Lisp side, we allocate an instance ID. That instance ID is on the fabric. The VRF is only on the switch side. And the virtual network is what Cisco DNA Center uses, and it makes sure that it corresponds a VRF to a specific instance ID. We also have the IP pools. Obviously, you've defined an IP pool on Cisco DNA Center. It's a subnet range where you can have clients connected to it. That subnet range gets transported to a, a VLAN and an SVI that we configure on all the edge devices that we'll look at later as well. On the Lisp side, that's the EID space that you will have where your clients are being located. Scalable groups, secure group tag inside the, the switch side. On the Lisp side, it's just a policy label inside every VXLAN packet. If you start deploying SDXs, you will by default start running SGT. Even if you don't have anything configured, if ICE is not pushing any SGT tags to your clients, the policy label will still be inside every packet. So the only thing you need to do to start using the secure side of the solution is to actually start defining the groups on ICE and pushing them towards the, the clients, which is a big difference from the enterprise networking if you now need to Traditional network, you need to do, transfer all your links to SGTs and then do the mapping there. So the basic operation from Lisp, the first thing, of course, you need to do, you need to register with the control plane node. If a host comes on, the edge switch will detect it. It will see the ARP from the, the edge device that it tries to get onto the network. As soon as it's being learned by the edge device, the edge device will register with the control plane node. You'll send a registration message saying, I learned this specific IP address behind me and my R is my specific loopback interface. The control plane puts that in his database. He starts making a database from one client. If another client comes up, he adds that as well. And at some point, he's going to get a full picture of the network. He knows this specific IP address is located behind edge number one. This specific IP address is located behind edge number two. As you can see, they are both in the same subnet, but they're on different switches. For Lisp, that's not a problem. Lisp works based upon slash 32s. So instead of actually having to get subnetting, you can just put your clients on any ad switch. They can belong to the same subnet. That doesn't matter for Lisp itself, because all the lookups are being done based upon host routes, not being done on subnets itself. Once you registered all your clients with it, obviously you need to take the next step. The remote side also needs to know where you're located. So the PC behind edge number one wants to send a packet. He sends it towards the, the network. The edge one switch will detect that packet, and he says, well, I got a client here from dot two. He wants to send a packet to dot three. The first thing he will do is we'll look up his map cache to see if he already knows the information. If he does not know the information where dot three is located, he will send a request to resolve that specific IP address to the control plane node. The control plane node will look it up in its database. OK, we need dot three. OK, dot three is located behind edge two. You will send it in a map reply towards edge one. And at that time, now edge one knows how to reach edge or reach the dot three IP address, which is located behind edge two. It puts it in a map cache so it can use it for subsequent web packets. It doesn't need to do it for every packet. So then afterwards, it gets a packet. It looks it up in the map cache. He knows, OK. If I need to reach dot three, I can reach it via RLOC from edge two. He encapsulates the packet into VXLAN. It sends it over via the underlay network to the remote side. The edge two detects the packet. He checks that the instance ID matches. He de-encapsulates it and sends it on to the edge client. So that's the basic operation. Yeah, sure. Good question. Uh, so the question is if the map cache is stored in the routing table. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, the map cache itself is just a LIPS, LISP map cache, so it's a separate process. It's not inside the routing table, because the routing table just contains the entry where we are, and the LISP process itself contains the map cache and will age it out, depending on if it sees any packets coming back and forth. Uh, the, there is a limit on the number of endpoints, and that's depending on per device. So every device obviously has a TCAM space, and because we program slash 32s, that's going to be a limiting space. But typically, that for edge devices, what they communicate to is normally they don't communicate inside the fabric. What you will see a lot, everybody connects to the servers. They connect to the internet. And that's really where we start building the map cache. And for going to the internet, for example, we don't build a map cache per entry. We just use the proxy ETR functionality. So it's only inside your network. And then you can even, if you go behind the border to your data center, which is where you expect most of your traffic to go 
because all your users need to go to the data center. That's going to be a slash 24 that the border will import. So scalability is normally, if you run into scalability issues, it's normally the border nodes. Because everybody connects to the border, and the border needs to connect to everybody else. That's why we see a lot of 6800s being used, because you have a large TCAM space, or ASR 4Ks, or 9500s. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Uh, if the packet is received on the edge and the mock request is sent, is that the original packet is being dropped or cached until the uh, few files received? Uh, so the question is if the first packet is being cached when we send the map request or if it's being dropped, correct? I'm not 100% sure, but I believe we cache it, and then we just when we get the response, we forward it on. But I need to double check it in the lab because I've got some traces that will show that we actually do cache it, but I'm not 100% sure if the first packet is there. But it's then only the initial packet and the subsequent packets should go through. But I can double check it in the, in the lab. Does that answer it? Okay. So to look at the data plane, as I said, we encapsulate the packets inside the SDXS fabric inside VXLAN. The reason that we use VXLAN is because we want to do a layer 2 and a layer 3 overlay. Your traditional packet, you have an Ethernet header and the IP header, and you have the payload. If we would have used the Lisp header, we only can put in the IP header. As you can see, we built a new packet. We got a new Ethernet header. We got a new IP header, UDP, and a Lisp header. But we're only going to get the IP header there. Because we also want to do layer 2 overlays, we are using VXLAN. Within VXLAN, we have the ability to just create a new header for transporting around the underlay. We have our VXLAN header. And then we encapsulate the full Ethernet, IP, and the payload, the full packet that we have as Itself. If you only transport traffic using the layer 3 overlay, we still create the layer 2 header inside the VXLAN packet, but it's more like a dummy header that doesn't mean anything, but it's still going to be present. For the layer 2 overlay, we can tunnel the entire packet between the fabric edge devices. So to look at how that actually looks on a sniffer trace, I'm looking at one of the frames. You can see we have the original packet. This is a layer 4. Layer 3 encapsulated packet, so you get a dummy header there. But you get your IP packet, your encapsulated packet. It's an ICMP packet from 192.168. something to another one, just a ping message. Then you get your VXLAN header, which is the one the header that we use to control inside the fabric. And then you get your new IP header to transport between the fabric edge nodes. Inside the VXLAN header, there are a few important fields inside of it. The first thing is the VNI field, what VXLAN calls it. We call it the Lisp instance ID, and that really correlates the virtual network inside the entire fabric. As I said before, on the switch sides, we use the VRF. And the VRF information basically gets lost when you go to Lisp. But there we use the Lisp instance ID. If you see a Lisp instance ID of 4K up to 8K, that's a layer 3 instance ID. If you see 8.1 and up, that's going to be a layer 2 instance ID. We also have the group policy. As I said, the SCT tag is carried inside every packet. If you don't have anything deployed, the policy label will be zero. But if you start using policy labels, you will see the secure group tag being encapsulated inside the VXLAN header. Yep, sure. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, you can see there it is. But that's an old slide from a year ago, so I'm not sure if that's still the original same thing. But there you can see that we do cache it because you see the ping replies coming back, but I'm not sure if that's still the current behavior, that's why. So to look at layer 3 forwarding, as you can see here, I expanded the diagram of the control plane out before it knew edge 1, edge 2. I added the border router to it because typically you're always going to get a border. It's where your DHCP server is located and a fabric with just end hosts is not very common. The H1 and H2, they have the host routes. And from the border, we can import specific route if it's an internal border. And then the border knows, OK, 172.16.0.0 slash 24. It gets imported into the control plane as well. So that's one way to reach the border. The other border is the proxy ETR functionality. If you have the proxy ETR functionality, it's basically a default gateway out of the fabric. If we don't know where to go, we're just going to send it to the proxy ETR. So look at the IP Anycast. So I'll try to make it bigger on my own screen so you can actually read it. Hopefully that works. So I need to log into my switch quickly. Forgot my password. It's really secret at Cisco. So. So 
So hopefully that's a bit more readable than the small outputs here. So that's why we keep it there. So the thing that we use with the layer 3 forwarding is an IP Anycast. The thing with the IP Anycast, what we do is we have one IP address and one MAC address. On all the Edge devices, we use the same thing. As you can see on the, the slides themselves, I got it from Edge 1, I got it from Edge 2. The configuration on the SVI is exactly the same. It has the same IP addresses, the same MAC addresses, the same VRF forwarding. And that allows us as well to add a lot of devices to the fabric without them actually all needing a different default gateway. Because if you have, for example, 100 devices in your fabric, they all need a different IP address, then you already exhausted 100 IP addresses from your IP pool. We use the IP Anycast address, but it's also one of the reasons that we actually say that we need a layer 3 uplink in the underlay network, because we use VLAN 1024, we use a static MAC address, and we use the same IP address. If you would do that in a layer 2 network, where the uplink would trunk VLAN 1024 by accident, if you have the same MAC address in 15 locations, you can see what that starts doing with your network. We start relearning, we start making a mess out of things. So that's one reason that it's really important to have a layer 3 uplink and not trunk any of the VLANs that we use for the downlinks back up to the core, because the network will get confused. The benefit of having the IP Anycast IP address is one side is that we don't need that many IP addresses for all the default gateway for all the clients. It's also for the client, it only has one IP address to reach to, so his default gateway will be known. It knows where it is, not dependent on where he's located. He's always going to go to that MAC address, and the uplink, the default gateway, will always be that specific IP address. It does introduce some challenges in the network, for example, like DHCP snooping and DHCP forwarding. That creates an issue. We'll look at that later as well. But it does create a lot of benefits as well. One thing, if you start troubleshooting, especially in the fabric, when you use IP Anycast, it's possible for the local switch to ping the endpoints located to the local end devices, but you cannot reach any remote IP addresses. The reason for that is, as you can see in the topology, if from the left switch I ping my .10 host, he's going to get a response, he's going to reply back to me. I'm the closest, 100.1, so I know I got my ping response back. If I start pinging the remote side, he's going to get, as well, a packet with the source 196.100.1, he's going to reply to it, but then switch to says, well, that's me, and he's going to absorb the packet. So while you initiated the ping, he's going to get the response. Obviously, if he gets the response, he's not going to tell you that he received the packet. So ping is not possible, connectivity is not possible inside the fabric to remote addresses. So if you need to troubleshoot, if you need to reach the devices, it's best to take a location outside the fabric, and then you can try pinging all the devices or just go to the, the separate edge nodes to be able to reach them. So there's something to, to look at, but that's the way that the fabric is being built. So registration with the control plane node, as I said before, the registration is based upon ARP. So as soon as we learn the ARP, it will be doing that. It will be registering the control plane and saying, OK, this specific endpoint is now located behind me. If it was already learned on a different location, it will roam it over and will give you that information. Device tracking is one of the things that we use inside the fabric to maintain the tables. Because we learn ARP, ARP is by default pretty, it takes a long time for that to age out. And that's why we use device tracking to be able to learn the devices and also maintain the devices. With device tracking, we learn the IP addresses, we learn the location, we know what the MAC address is and what port they are. And one of the benefits as well is that we can send them ARP probes to make sure that the devices are reachable. By default, ARP, you know, we re-ARP every four hours. After four hours, we know if it's still alive. With device tracking, we know the device, we know where it's located, and we send an ARP probe every five minutes. We can see, is it reachable, is it down? and we can detect a device that's been disconnected much faster than having to wait till it ages out four hours or something else happens. So that's why we use device tracking. Device tracking is also quite a useful feature to be actually to see who's located where, where your clients are located, which VLAN they are on, and where they belong to. You can also see how they're being learned, DHCP, ARP, and where they're located. So once it's being registered, we're going to upload it, or we're going to send that information to the, the control plane out on the local device. That's the, let me just let it here. So we have a database of all the local MAC addresses that we have on the switch. You can see it learned a few local ones here. 
.18.19, I learned on my specific switch. It will give you the information, like it's using the default locator set, which is the loopback zero that has been pushed. It's reachable, and it's site itself. So that's the information from the database, and that's the things that he's advertising out to the control plane. So if you have reachability issues with a specific client, it's always good to check the database to make sure, do we still know it locally on my switch? Because if I'm not in the database, he's not going to report it up either to the control plane node. There are some devices, sometimes they age out. Device tracking is monitoring that. So if they age out, then they start being reported into the SMR table, the solicited map per clip table as away. Away just means device tracking. You know, you looked at it, the device is not responding anymore. And we don't get the registration anymore with the uplinks. Let me just see if I have any in my lab that are away. Uh, show IP list. So here in my lab, I have everything is there. Everybody is actually alive and up and running. If one of them would be idling, they would be reported as away. And then if you then look at the away table, you can also see that it's gone away. Some, so the question that you had is like if we can use the R probing to make silent host speak, correct? Yep. Unfortunately, not all the silent hosts actually respond back to R probes. So we, we do try that, and that's one of the reasons why we use R, the, the R probes. But some of these silent devices, they really want to remain silent. And even if we send an R probe, they don't respond to it. So that kind of the issue, and then you need to start using layer two flooding. I don't know why they don't respond to it, but it's, we use a specific IP address, and then they just ignore the ARP, and we cannot keep them alive. Well, even though we, we try with more aggressive timers, the devices, they just don't like our ARPs for some reason, because we use the 0000 IP address, and then they just ignore us. So that's, we've been looking at solutions for that, and the only way we have at the moment for silent hosts is the layer two flooding, and then with the layer two flooding, we can just reach them, and then the end devices can still ping them. Does that answer it? Yeah. But we'll be very happy if those devices start responding to our R probes, but that's at the moment a problem that we have. So if I look at the control plane out side of things, the as I said before, the control plane out has the total view of the network. So if you use the show lisp site command, you get all the registrations, all the various MAC addresses, everything that's being learned. What you see on the show list site, firstly, of course, you don't see any VRF information. The control plane node is totally unaware of the fact that there is a VRF. It's just purely a Lisp device. It knows instance IDs, it registers instance IDs, and that's pretty much everything that it wants to show. It will tell you who last registered it. That's the RLOC information from the edge device that's trying to reach your specific device, and it will tell you the specific EID prefix. You have some slash 24s, you have some slash 30s, slash 28s. It all depends on who registers it, who brings it into the network. Host entries are typically slash 32s, but a control play node or the, the border node might also send slash 24 information, slash 28 information. And you have the, the EID space itself that's also being shown. We saw as well that the the status of the EID from the RLOC, it's yes, it's reachable, it's up. And then we also show a hashtag. The hashtag shows that we use the reliable transport. Originally with Lisp, the registration was being done by UDP packets. We use the TCP reliable registration feature to be able to alert that. And then you can see the hashtag, and you can see there is a specific Lisp session. It's a TCP session between the edge devices towards the switch that we use to make sure that the devices are still up and running. So if you look as well on the show list session, yep. on the control plane node, you typically see all the devices that have registered with it. So you can, it's a good way to do a health check as well on your network. If you do show list site or low show list session on your control plane node, you should see all your edge devices inside the fabric that they are coming up, that they registered, and they can export their information towards you. So resolving remote destinations, that's of course also very important inside the network. A fabric edge device needs to reach other devices. That's what you have your fabric built for. To be able to do that, you have your map cache information. Let me just 
open it as well on this. So the map cache information contains all the information that it cached. So when it gets a reply back from the control plane node, it puts it into a cache with a 24-hour time frame. So it will maintain that specific table for 24 hours. If it gets a negative map reply back from the control plane node, it puts it in, but it takes a shorter timer. And it will reduce the, the amount that you need to look up. One thing that you also notice with the map cache, sometimes you see very strange entries in there. I showed it here on my. PowerPoint 32.0.0.3 slash .0 .0 three. That's a map reply that came back from the control plane node. The edge device tried to reach a device that the control plane node did not know where it's located. Instead of responding back every specific response, the control plane node just looks at the biggest continuous block that it does not know where it's located, and we'll put that in the response. So here I tried to ping a device in that block. It says, well, OK, I don't know anything from this block to that block. And that will reduce the number of map replies or the map request that the control plane nodes is getting by just advertising, OK, I don't know this, and that's what it is. So it's something that you will see in your map cache. It just means somebody is looking into there, and you might see a subnet that you did not use in your network, and you just see it appearing there It's in the map cache itself. As you can see there as well, the uptime is only two minutes. It expires in 12 minutes. That means it's 15 minutes map caching timeout to remove those negative map replies. So positive map replies, it will be 24 hours. Sure. So the, the question is, what happens if a device moves from one to the other one? That there's some R-Log probing as well that goes on, and there's some notifications that can go on between the edge device. So this is really stale information. And there's also if there's, for example, a network change, a network topology, we also start reprobing it. So the 24 hours is just really, if nothing happens, if we don't get an update, then we'll keep it for 24 hours. If somebody moved around, then we update it faster. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So to look at the forwarding table, that Lisp builds itself, show IP Lisp. Not so fast in typing today, so it takes a while. Yeah, the remote. Where? Somehow missing up. I even forgot what command I was using. Ah, forwarding. So it, if you look at the remote table, you can see a lot of useful information with regards to the subnets and the entries that it knows about. Here in this case, you will see 0.0.0. .0. The forward action is signal. You have the slash 25 is ANCAP. When you have an ANCAP action, that means, OK, we know where it's located. We can just put it into Lisp, and we can encapsulate it. If there's a subnet that says signal, that means, OK, bring it up to the CPU, and the CPU will do the lookup towards the map cache. If there's a drop entry, it will just say, OK, we'll drop the entry. So mostly what you will see is signal for the subnets and the ANCAP, if there's any good information that we know in the map cache information, then we can encapsulate it in Lisp and forward it down. But for all the unknown destinations that we need to resolve, we will have the, the signal forward action. One thing that's also useful to look at, what we use a lot for troubleshooting, is Ceph information. Ceph contains the routing tables. And it will also tell us exactly how to forward packets. In the end, it's a switch. The switch does an IP address lookup. And Ceph is the primary source where you can start looking the forwarding information base. OK, this subnet, we're going to point there. This client, we're going to point there. So looking at Ceph, you can get a lot of information. You can already get the routing table. If the interface is Lisp 0.4099, 4098, 497, it's going to be encapsulated and sent over the fabric. If it has VLAN 1024, it's a local entry, and we start pushing it towards local. With Ceph, you can get a lot more information as well for a specific host route. For example, if I use the 19 and then detail, you can get a lot more further information. You can see exactly where we learned it, what the egress interface is, but we can also see what the, the next hub would be inside the underlay network. This is a local host, so we just show the next hub is 192.168.1029. 
But if you would have some route, let me see if I get one route that's located over the fabric. You can also see the next hop information, the airlock information that we use, and also the So you can see the next hop information is the R-lock information. Over the list 0.4.99 interface, we need to go to the next hop, 10.254.255.2. That's the R-lock of the remote side. So all the packets needing to go to that specific subnet will encapsulate it, and we send it via VXLAN towards instance ID, list instance ID 4.99, and then R-lock will be that specific one. So SEFS gives a lot of information, especially when troubleshooting. It's a really good source of information because it will tell you what the switch is doing with the packet, not what Lisp wants to do with the packet, not what IP protocols want to do with the packet, but really what Ceph wants to do with the packet, and that's being pushed downwards towards the hardware. So it's a very good source of information for troubleshooting, and it will typically give you the right information what actually is happening with your packets. You also can get some more information with regards to the forwarding. As you can see here, if I add detail behind it, it will give me much more information with regards where it learned it, how it learned it, and what it's going to do with that. The same thing it shows you for the map cache and for the forwarding. It will give you a lot of information where the egress interfaces are, where the R locks are that you need to use, and the age and the cache entries itself. So DHCP in the fabric, a quick overview. With DHCP, we have a specific problem that we use for DHCP operation in the layer 3 environment. We send a packet towards, we use a relay function, so we take the packet coming from the local LAN, and we forward it to a DHCP server. For the DHCP server to know where the packet actually came from, we insert the GI address. The GI is the gateway IP address inside the IP packet, and that's also the IP address where the DHCP server will be responding to to actually give the client the IP address. That works really well in traditional networking, but with SD access, we have a problem that we have an IP Anycast IP. So all the devices and all the edge nodes, they will have the same IP address. So when a packet goes to the DHCP server, when it comes back, we need a method to actually see what the ingress edge node was that actually inserted the packet into the fabric, because just based on the GI address, it can be any of them. So to be able to do that, we're using the option 82 information. There's a specific Lisp header that we will introduce. We'll look at the specific agent remote ID encoding later. But that's what we push into the packet. That's why we also have the requirement for DHCP servers when you use them at SD access. They need to be option 82 capable. What a device typically, a DHCP server typically does with option 82, it just gets that information. It gives you the offer back into the DHCP, and it copies the information that we put in there and copies it back and sends it back to us. The packet will then arrive on the border. The border can extract the information that the edge device put in. He then extracts it, and he knows which edge device actually originated that specific DHCP request, and then he can forward it to the correct edge node. The edge node will get it, and then it will give it to the client, and the client can continue with the DHCP exchange. So to look at that specific agent ID, remote ID encoding, it's just a field that we put in there. We already had the sub option one and two for Mac OS and string, but we created a new one which is called Lisp. Within that specific Lisp uh, option, we have the Lisp instance ID. Obviously, we need to know which virtual network actually the packet belonged to. And we also put in there the IPv4 or the IPv6 locator. Currently, we only support IPv4, but for the future, when we have IPv6, we can also support IPv6 locators. Then you get the hex encoding of the R lock of the device. If the border node gets a specific packet, he extracts it. He knows the instance ID, he knows the R lock, and he can forward the DHCP packet onto the respective edge node to forward to the client. So, how that works on the, the switch side? We have three different debugs that you can enable to be able to see the DHCP on the edge device. One is debug IP DHCP snooping. DHCP snooping is the first thing that sees the packet. It absorbs it from the, the LAN, and it will insert the option 82 information. Then you have the relay functionality, which you need debug IP DHCP server packet for. And then to make it easy, our developers decided that if you want to have more detail regarding DHCP, you need to enable debug DHCP detail. 
DHCP debugs by default are for the client, but if you enable debug DHCP detail, we actually show you more information inside the snooping and the server debugs. So if you enable all those three debugs, you can see what's happening on the client side. Here we got a client coming on, received a packet from the input interface, and there detects it, okay, I'm gonna encode it with a router, uh, remote ID in SR lock format. That means we're gonna introduce the, I the information. Then you get the binary dump of the relay information. You can see there in the end, the IP address of that specific host, X10, X3, 1A. It introduces it into the network, and then it gets sent to the DHCP relay functionality. The DHCP relay functionality then takes the packet from DHCP snooping. It says, okay, I'm coming in on VLAN 1024. What's the IP helper address configured on that one? And he's gonna do the help ring, setting the GI address to the IP Anycast IP address. He sends it onto the fabric, and the fabric will push it onto the DHCP server. Hopefully the DHCP server will then reply we see it coming back, forwarding boot P reply to client. So we take it from the fabric, we de-encapsulate it, and we want to push it back to VLAN 1021. Then DHCP server is done the relay functionality. The packet still passes through the DHCP snooping. DHCP snooping sees, okay, this is a DHCP offer for this specific client. He checks everything, he strips the option 82 information, and he will forward the reply out directly to the client. The client gets his offer, then it can finish the exchange, first you have the discover, offer, the reply, and then the acknowledge. So they all take the same path, and then they should be able to get an IP address for the client. So those three debugs are quite useful. You need to look at both of them. Sometimes if you have a large topology, you might need a lot of buffer space to be able to get all the information. But for troubleshooting it, it's really important to look at both the layers, both the DHCP server functionality and the DHCP snooping functionality. Layer 2 forwarding in the fabric, we don't just support layer 3 forwarding, we also do a layer 2 overlay. In layer 2 overlay, we built a Lisp instance ID based upon MAC addresses. So where before we saw the control plane node just learning the IP addresses, with layer 2 overlay, we also learn the layer 2 forwarding, we load, uh, the source MACs on all the devices. So what happens if an edge device learns a specific MAC address, the same thing as it does with layer 3 Lisp, we just register with a control plane node. The control plane node builds a database of all the MAC addresses inside the layer 2 domain. We forward traffic using the VXLAN, but where with the layer 3 instance, we just use the a dumber layer 2 header. We can, for layer 2 overlay, we can just transport the entire layer 2 frame. So you can, inside the IP pools, if you have two clients talking to each other and they're in the same subnet, we will not be using layer 3 list. We will just tunnel the exact packet from A to B and from B to A. So for that, we have on Cisco DNA Center a mode called Layer 2 Extension, and we have Layer 2 Flooding. Those are the two modes that we can use to enable the Layer 2 transport inside the, the fabric. In the old days with DNA Center 1.0, the default mode was using purely Layer 3. Then we used proxy, local proxy ARP that's being devaluated at the moment, and Layer 2 Extension is the default mode. And what we do is we create a Layer 3, a Layer 2 instance per VLAN that's assigned to it, so every SVI will have a, a layer two instance associated with it, as I showed there. It's service Ethernet, EID table, VLAN 1024, links it to a specific VLAN information. The best way at the moment to actually find the layer two instance mapping to a specific VLAN is by doing show run section router Lisp and just scroll to it to be able to get the layer two instance information. One thing that we do, we do not flood traffic by default with the layer 2 extension. The only way what we have is unicast traffic for layer 2 to the fabric. Later on, we added layer 2 flooding as well. But with layer 2 extension, we do not pass through broadcast, not unicast, not multicast. Everything was done based purely on knowing the MAC address and where it's located. With layer 2 flood mode that changed, then we can create a multicast underlay group where all the edge nodes subscribe to it. And then we can flood traffic to the fabric. But if you do not have that, all the traffic is being unicasted. That does generate a problem for ARP, obviously. It's a broadcast. It's not being flooded through the network. We tunnel it through the network. And how we do that, we'll look at that future slide as well. Just look first at the layer 2 macOS tables. Here you can see just a show macOS table command. One thing to notice, I normally use show macOS dynamic to look at the information for a VLAN. 
If you do it with show as the access, you will only see the dynamic learned addresses. The tunnel addresses, which are the remote addresses, they also learn dynamic, but they do not show up there. So to look at the entire layer two table, the local and the remote addresses, you need to use show MAC address, and then you just pipe includes VLAN 1024. That way, you can also get the local addresses that you dynamically learn, and you can see there are a few entries there that are being CP learned, and the interface is tunnel zero, and the tunnel zero means, OK, we learned that specific MAC address over the tunnel itself. So it's, it's a remote Lisp MAC address. It's sometimes a bit annoying, especially if you're like me, used to typing show MAC address dynamic to see everything, and then you don't see the remote MAC addresses, and you have to use the, the include and just look at it like that. So you can see the local entries, the remote entries. The SVI MAC address is a static MAC address as well. We override the burn-in address to be able to get it for the SVI. So these slides are fortunately big enough, so I don't have to use my screen. So if you look at the show MAC address, there you can see it again, 1024. Show Lisp instance ID, 819 Ethernet database. That's the local mapping for all the MAC addresses that we learn on the local side. Here I'm using 16.9, so we can see that we already fixed the bug that we do not show the Mac OS dynamics anymore. The other slide was from 16.6. With 16.9, we start showing them already. With the local database, you can see the local addresses that we learned and the ones that we registered with Lisp, so they were being pushed up towards the control plane node. And if you then look at the control plane node side of things, use the command show Lisp instance ID. Before, we used the show IP Lisp, but obviously, IP Lisp doesn't work for Ethernet commands. So you use show Lisp instance ID. Then you give the instance ID. Or you can use a star if you're using the 69 release that you can look for all of them. And then you can do Ethernet server. And on the control plane node, it will show you all the MAC addresses, where they're located, what the instance ID they are associated with, and who the one that registered them on the specific network. Here we can see a lot of MAC addresses that we learned. Some of them, obviously, are for my test devices. Some are just devices in my network. And they're all associated to instance ID 8191. So that's the Ethernet server. We can see them there as well. You can also look at more information with regards to that. If you specify one specific address to look at, you can get some more information. You get the RLOC information. We can see how it, when it registered, where it registered, and some more statistics. You can also see that it's using a proxy reply. Traditional in Lisp, what was happening is if you send a request to the control plane node, the control plane node would not respond themselves. It would forward it to the other edge device that would respond saying, OK, I got this located. If we're using a proxy reply, the control plane node is being instructed, OK, if you get a request for my specific MAC address, you know, just respond on my behalf. And that's the proxy reply flag that we use. So in this case, the control plane node, he knows the MAC address, and he will be able to respond to the information. So ARP, as I said before, that's kind of a problem inside the, the fabric. ARP is a multicast, or it's a broadcast packet that's being sent by a client to resolve it. We have clients in the same subnet located behind different edge switches. Without layer two flooding, we cannot flood the packet through. So what we're doing, we're using address resolution information, and we register that with the control plane node. So it's one thing that device tracking is doing. Once it learns a specific IP address mapping to a specific MAC address, you will also report that to the control plane node. So the control plane node does not just know where the MAC address is located, but it also knows what IP addresses are associated with it. So when an edge device wants to ARP out for a specific IP address, he sends it out. Device tracking will snoop the packet. He will detect the packet. OK, this is the packet. He's going to ask the control plane node, do you know where that host is located? If the control plane node gives them that information back saying, yes, this specific IP address is located behind this R lock, and this is the destination MAC address, we rewrite the packet from a broadcast packet to a unicast packet, and we tunnel it over layer 2 Lisp to the remote side. So the packet DR will be exactly the same, except the destination MAC address will be rewritten from a broadcast address to a unicast address. And then even without layer 2 flooding, we can send the packet over the fabric to the remote side. With layer 2 flooding, starting with 16.10.1s, it was kind of broken in 16.92s. We can also flood the ARP2. As you can see on the sniffer trace that I cut and pasted the small part of there, we got the host dot .19 ARPing out for dot .33. Dot .33 is not a known IP address, so you get a broadcast as being flooded throughout the network using the multicast underlay. 
If it tries to ARP out for dot .14, it's a known IP address. It doesn't need to flood it. It's rewriting the MAC address and sending it, unicasting it directly towards the other edge node. The other edge node gets the response. You know, he sends an ARP reply, and it comes back to the 19, and they can start exchanging packets. With layer two modes, traffic inside the same IP pool, inside the same VLAN, is always going to be sent unicasted directly. We're not going to use layer three forwarding for that. If you obviously have traffic going out of your subnet, that's going to use the layer three mode. So the way that works, the endpoint sends an R broadcast to wants to resolve it. The fabric adds a snoop set. You know, it's the device tracking protocol that takes care of it. You can also see that with the show device tracking database command. You see your local entries, and you can also see some tunnel entries. And if you see a tunnel entry there, that's one of the lookups that has been done to the control plane. We rewrite the destination MAC address to unicast, and then we just flood it over to the remote site. If you look at that on the ARP capture, here I took a capture of one specific ARP. Before, above that, you can already see also the control plane exchange where before the ARP actually was being forwarded, we got an encapsulated map request for unknown. Wireshark does not know the layer two protocol yet. So it just sees a map request coming out for something he doesn't understand. But that's the specific lookup that we're doing. Okay, the control plane is being queried. I got this specific IP address. And then you get the control plane saying back, OK, here's your map reply. And it contains the information that we need to actually rewrite the packet and forward it on to the layer two destination. The broadcast address is being rewritten from FFFFF to the destination. I got two VMware hosts here that they communicate to each other. And it's a unicast ARP just traveling over the network. The rest of the packet is still the same. Nothing else is being changed there. We don't fill in the target MAC address. We don't fill anything in. The ARP is still exactly the same. The only thing that we do is rewrite the outer Ethernet header. So device tracking, that's really the protocol that we use for that. It snoops the packet, it forwards the packet. And the good thing is it needs to know that information. As you can see in this output, we have tunnel 0 for the remote IP addresses. We have gig 1017, 1012 for the local IP addresses. So it learns it. So the important thing is he re rewrites it for the remote destination. But the thing it also needs to do is the local mapping. It needs to actually advertise to the control plane, this is my IP address, and this is the MAC address associated with it. To see the mapping that the local edge device knows about, you can use the command show Lisp instance ID 8191 for this specific thing. Ethernet database, like we used to look at the MAC addresses before. But if you add address resolution behind it, it will tell you the information. It also knows about the layer 3 information. In this case, we have three different MAC addresses. One has an IP address, one has an IPv4, and an IPv6 address. A lot of devices are dual stack at the moment, so it's typical that you will see some IPv6 addresses. It's just linked local, FE80, but it's being learned as well. But we don't support IPv6 inside the SDX fabric at this moment. That's going to be coming in a later release. And if you then look at the control plane information, the control plane obviously needs to know from all the devices who's located where. Then you can use the same command, show Lisp instance ID 8191, Ethernet server, address resolution, and you get the mapping for all the various MAC addresses towards the IP addresses. If you have any problems with ARP inside your fabric, it's always good to check on the control plane node. Does the control plane node actually know that information? If the control plane node does not know where an IP address is, Obviously, it cannot tell an edge device where it's located. So it's always a good place to check, and it also makes a good picture of your entire network, who's located where, what's the MAC addresses, what the IP addresses, and where they're located. As you can see, it already learns the IPv6 information. Theoretically, it might actually forward it, but it's currently not a supported thing, so you might run into some strange things. But I believe that's going to be targeted for a future release that will have IPv6 host support as well. And in that case, we'll be using the same Methodology. As I said, only the known IP addresses will be sent through the fabric using unicast. If you have any broadcast to an unknown, for example, the silent host that you have before, you need to use the layer 2 flooding mode. And then layer 2 flooding mode relies on an underlay multicast group where we can use to actually send traffic from one edge node to all the other edge nodes inside the network. Then to look at authentication. Authentication inside the fabric is quite important because you have software-defined access. You provide flexibility inside your network. 
So the last thing you want to do is go to every Edge device and configure it statically to what IP pool it needs to be and what it belongs to. Authentication helps with that. All the endpoints, they need to belong to a specific IP pool or a specific VN. We recommend using ICE for that because you have a good ICE integration between DNA Center and ICE. Whatever DNA Center configures, he creates pools, he creates VNs. It gets being pushed towards the ICE server. So with ICE, you don't need to remember VLAN names or anything. You can just say, OK, I want to assign this specific group for my domain controller to this specific VN, to this specific IP pool. And then we can authenticate like that. We support authentication via .1x, MAP, or central web access. That's mostly done something that the ICE server will do. It will just give the information for the clients. Most devices, they support .1x these days, but a lot of devices also do MAP. If you use ICE, you can also use a profiling on top of it to be able to get even more information and get the assignment of the devices into the right permissions and everything else. We do support third party, but Third party is not recommended, mostly because we don't support SGT tags on third parties. And ICE will help with the integration with DNA Center. So we have four authentication profiles that we can use with ICE. They're not too tunable. There are some things you can choose on Cisco DNA Center. But in general, they are closed authentication. It's based on .1x. If .1x is failing, it will fall over to MAP. We have the open authentication. Every client can just connect to the network. It doesn't matter what they are. We'll apply the permissions later on. Easy Connect, it's the same thing with Open Auth, but then we have a pre-auth ACL as well. So clients can come onto the network, but we limit what they can till the moment that we actually authenticate them, and then we can open up the network or even make it smaller. Or you can use no authentication for devices that you don't care about. You make a static configuration that belongs to this IP pool, that specific thing. That's for devices that you don't really want to do any authentication. So those are the four profiles. They are a bit tunable. There are some timers you can change. You can change the order, first map, dot one x But it's quite limited with what we support at the moment. And most of the environments, they use the closed authentication or the open authentication with the, the ACL. Yep, go ahead, please. Uh, so the question is if you can use closed authentication with ACLs, right? Yes. Yeah. So theoretically, that's possible. But within the fabric, which we will talk about later, we use SGT for enforcement. So you could use ACLs, but you can also choose to use the SGTs. But it's possible that ICE will say, OK, I'm pushing this specific ACL out. It's a guest VLAN. I just want to have that. But you can also use the SGT tagging. But both are possible depending on what your security profile is and what you want to achieve. Does that answer it? So some key radius attributes that we see being passed down from ICE towards the edge devices. Voice permission, obviously, for IP phones. An IP phone can get profiled by DNA Center. The voice permission is needed to actually go into the voice domain. The security group tag is something that the, the policy that we have for using SGTs. The VLAN ID or name, ICE can also just program the, the VN and the IP pool that will give you in the ICE view. But Underlaying it will still be assigning it to a specific VLAN ID that's being pushed from DNA Center. Reauthentication timers is also something important in some environments. You know, you need to reauthenticate. By default, we do ask ICE, like, what are the reauthentication timers that you want to use? Some devices, MAP devices, you don't want to reauthenticate too much because it's kind of intrusive for reauthentication. But for phones, especially if you have a phone behind an IP phone, you might want to have re-authentication timers. And we have the ACLs that you might want to download. We prefer using the SGTs, of course, because it's more scalable than using the dynamic access list. But it's also possible just push an access list down saying, OK, I'm going to limit that client to that specific protocol. The key thing to troubleshooting the access session is to show access session detail commands. It contains a lot of information regarding the authentication. Obviously, one thing too important to look at is the, the state of the authentication. Is it authorized? Is it unauthorized? Once the client is authorized, it will show you there. The operational host mode, we have various modes with authentication. With SDX is the most mode we use, the multi auth so multiple PCs on the same port can connect to it. But you could also have single authentication, single host mode, or just multi-domain mode. With SDX, it's multi auth that we use the most because we can have the IP phones and multiple clients connected to one specific port. 
The current policy, what's being applied, you know, this one is the PMAP default wire dot one x closed authentication dot one x map. So that's the, one, the policy that's being applied to the port and that has been used to actually apply that authentication at this moment. The method dot one x, we by default we run dot one x a map. So the first we try to dot one x when we detect the MAC address on the port. We try to reach it with an EPOL message saying, okay, start authentication. If the client does not authenticate via EPOL, then we'll follow over to map. With the method list, you can see where the client authenticated, especially sometimes if you see a client being unauthorized, it's always good to see what method it actually used. Did it fall back to map and it's an unknown client, or is it really dot one x and the client might have just mistyped this password? The state, authentication successful. You have authentication and authorization. So this one, authentication successful, completed everything. Device tracking information that we also learned from that specific port is also showing in the show access session information detail. The IP address, the IPv4 address, the IPv6 address. The username that authenticated, of course, is also quite important to see who's connected to that port. This one is called test user from a lab, but it might also be just a MAC address. If it's using MAP, you see the MAC address there, or you see the specific user that connected to that specific port. We also do some profiling on the device itself. Here we profile it to become an Intel device based upon the MAC address. It can be an IP phone, it can be anything else. That's the local profiling to see, okay, this is the device type, what we think it is, and it's also in the show access session detail. And at the end, we're also going to get the authorization results. Here we got the VLAN group, VLAN 1029. VLAN 1029 associated to a specific IP pool and to a specific VN. And the SCT value that we send down from ICE, SCT value 4 has been used for this specific client. So that's also very important, the authorization results. If you have a DAC on, it also shows it there. It actually shows, okay, what ICE actually has been sending down to that specific client. Debugging radius and authentication in iOS XC16.x is a bit different than you would have traditionally done it in traditional iOS. In iOS XC3.x, we have SMD being part of the iOS daemon. Within the Polaris architecture, iOS 16.x, we take an authentication out and put it into its own process. It's the SMD process. It's a separate process running on the, un on the underlying kernel. So traditional debugs for dot one x and radius, you can still enable them on iOS XC16.x, but it will not show you any output. Debug radius will not show you the exchange. Debug.1x will not show you any packets. Debug authentication will not show you anything. The only thing that you will see there is somebody SSHs to the device itself. Then you will see radius starting to get triggered. That's because everything is being handled by SMD, including radius. So to be able to troubleshoot .1x or authentication on iOS XC16.x, you need to look at the the trace messages. So you can set the debugs with the set platform software trace, SMD, switch, switch ID, R0, and then the facility. There are a lot of facilities like dot one x authentication, radius, and then you can set it to a specific log level. The benefit of using trace messages as well is that it's binary, so the performance impact of debugging is a lot less than you would have with the traditional iOS debugs. Once you set a specific debug level to higher, by default, everything is just to set to a high level that you don't get too much information. Here I put radius to debug. I did a request, and then you can see with the show platform software, trace messages, switch, switch ID, SMD, R0, you can see the radius messages. The problem with the trace messages as well is that you get all the messages from SMD, not just the specific one that you had the debug enabled for. So it's always good to just include radius or include debug or include whatever specifically you want to see to be able to scan through the messages itself to get where you need. So it's quite important to know when you start troubleshooting dot one x issues that you need to look at the trace messages and not the deep standard debugs themselves. So the secure fabric, that's something that we implemented within the fabric to be able to allow you to have policies defined inside the network. The way that the secure fabric works is that you have all your clients, all your endpoints are not, are of course, they have an IP address, but the authentication or the, the access list that we are building is not based upon the endpoint, but is based upon a secure group tag. So all the devices, they get assigned a specific SGT tag. By default, they will have all zero, but ICE can post that information back saying, okay, this specific client has SGT tag four, five, six, seven, eight, 
which on DNA sent and on ICE corresponds to a specific group name. The CTS tag is carried inside every packet, the policy label, so every packet through the fabric will be looked at. And then on the remote side, because SCTS is based upon destination enforcement, we will look at, okay, I'm getting a packet in from group number two, it's going to group number four. It has a matrix saying, okay, is this allowed, is this or not allowed? In this case here, I got the, the grouping SCT234 for three different IP addresses. And I got a mapping there saying from two to three is permit SSH. So I make an access list there saying SSH traffic is permitted, all other traffic is being dropped. From two to four, I don't want any traffic to go from two to four. Even if they're in the same subnet, I don't want two to talk to four, all the traffic should be dropped. So on the egress side, it just looks at the IP address, the destination IP address, and say, okay, my destination IP address here is dot four, it belongs to SGT4. What's the incoming packet? The incoming packet is coming from secure group tag two. The mapping two to four, deny all, packet is being dropped on egress. If you go from two to three, permit SSH, it goes from two to three, it's looking, okay, this is an SSH packet, it's being permitted, it will allow it through, any other packets will be dropped. So we decouple the IP address throughout the network by just making it groups, which makes it much more scalable, it makes it much easier to deploy as well. You don't need to assign a long list of IP addresses, client can just get any IP addresses, and what ICE will do is we'll just assign the SGT tag towards that specific client, and that specific client will then be linked to that specific group. You can define those groups either on ICE, there's a matrix there, the CTS matrix, that you can define your access list and your group mappings, or you can use Cisco DNA Center, there's a policy tab there as well. You just select a few groups, this group to that group, and then you can define a contract on top of it. Once you do that on Cisco DNA Center, that specific policy is being pushed towards the ICE, ICE will then take that information, populate its matrix, and will alert all the devices via change of authorization request saying, I've got an updated, mat updated matrix for this specific thing. You know, if you are using it, come and download it. So Cisco TrustSec, as I said, every endpoint gets associated with an SGT tag. So the SGT tag is really what we do the enforcement on, not the IP address itself. The Fabric devices, they download the CTS environment from the radius server. So as soon as it comes up, CTS is enabled. The Edge device will contact the radius server saying, OK, I need the environment data. So that contains all the group information and everything. You will download it, we'll get that information, and we'll contain it on the switch. And then we do the mapping based on SGT to DGT mapping. We do on egress side, so the enforcement, we send the packet first to the network and then we drop it, which is a bit different from an access list that you can apply on ingress, that the ingress side will do it. But it shouldn't cause too much extra bandwidth in the network because if you drop the first TCP session, that's only the only packet that's going to go through. There's also a default action. You can either use whitelisting or blacklisting. With Cisco DNA Center, at the moment, we only do blacklisting. So by default, everything is permitted. Everybody can talk to everybody. And then you start limiting your traffic based upon your groups. You can also, for CTS itself, if you change it on ICE, do blacklisting. And then you just say, nothing is permitted unless I specifically want to have it enabled. So the default action that we use with Cisco DNA Center is permit IP any any. So everybody can talk to everybody. So the first thing is you need to look at the CTS environment. CTS uses group names. With the CTS environment data, you can also see the group name to the number mapping. You use the show CTS environment data. It's quite an important command when you start troubleshooting CTS because if you cannot get the environment data from the radius server, there's typically a communication problem between CTS on the switch and the radius server, some key mismatch or something. And if it cannot get the environment data, it can also not get the mapping information. So the first thing to always look at is the, the current state. It should be complete. It should have a IP address for the server where it downloaded from, and it should get all the security group name, name table as well, which sometimes easy, especially because you're troubleshooting on a device. And the switch side is using the, the group IDs, while on the I side, you're using the names and on Cisco DNA Center. So CTS enforcement, obviously you need to look at the, the details of who's located where. You can see the mapping, what IP address belongs to what specific SGT group. You can do that with the show CTS role-based SGT map command. 
You can then specify your specific VRF, VRF brew ask that I'm using in my lab environment, and then the IP address. And then you can see, OK, this specific IP address has got this specific SGT tag being allocated. You can also see it with show access session, but then you need to look at all the access session details to be able to get a mapping. And with one that specific command, you can get all the mappings from all the hosts that are locally learned so you know what the source SGT will be. Then the next thing you can look at the show CTS role-based permissions 2.4. As I said, it's destination enforcement. So if we have a client that's being part of SGT group 4, we will download the information to say, OK, who can talk to 4? We don't download the information who 4 can talk to because it's not relevant for us. We only want to know, OK, what specific groups can talk to it and which one will take the default action and which one will just have to apply a specific SGT 4. Then we can also look at the access list. By default, you can do deny any or permit any, but you can also make an access list saying, OK, from this group to this group, I want to permit SSH. I want to permit Telnet. Here I got one RBACL, the role-based access list, saying, OK, permit TCP destination equal 23, deny IP. So this is Telnet. All that can be done towards the four coming from group number development will be test contract and test contract consists of the fact that we can only do Telnet. So that's the mapping between everything. If any of these things are not being downloaded from ICE, then we just apply the default action, and the default action will either be permit IP any any or deny IP any any. There's also a field there. If you look at the, the test contract that can increment at some times, you see test contract 01, 02, 03. If there's any change in the contract, we'll get a new version of that specific contract to make sure all the devices are in sync. So we start with zero, then it becomes two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it keeps on incrementing every time you have a change in the CTS environment. So that's quite important to download. Sometimes we've seen that, that you know, the contract has not been downloaded, or a contract one side or the other side is not matching. And then, obviously, that might be a problem. So monitoring SGT traffic. Now, the counters are accumulated. The problem is it's per switch. So you can see the counters in the mapping between 12 and 4, 13 to 4. Here we got two groups being present on the switch. You can see there are some clients that are zero. They might be unauthenticated. Some clients that have four. And we can see the group mapping. OK, we have some information from 4 to 0, 12 to 0, 0 to 4, and 12 to 4. And we got the, the counters per switch for all the information that we get. We have hardware monitor, software monitoring. You can use CTS monitoring as well to get some information, some logging. By default, DNA Center will not do that, but it is possible with CTS. Then you get your hardware permit, your software permit, which means, OK, this is either a packet that's being permitted by the hardware forwarding or the software forwarding if you have any packets coming from the CPU or we're doing CPU forwarding to be able to transmit the packet. We have hardware denied, software denied. Obviously, if you're hitting any of those, you should be able to drop the packets, and you should be seeing those increment as well. It is per box, but the counters are quite reliable, so you should be able to see everything. One thing that we also have is the star star. So if any traffic is coming into your network that might not match that specific group, so if traffic is coming in from 4 to 4 or from 12 to 12, it will not hit any of these specific groups, so it will hit the star star. So the star star is really the default bucket. If you don't hit any of the cells inside the table, that's where you start hitting it. So. There might be a lot of traffic hitting it, especially if you, for example, have 12 to 12. If a lot of clients are talking inside the same SGT, and you don't have any specific access list for that defined, which is something you can also define saying, well, I want to go from 12 to 12, or I don't want to go from 12 to 12. But if you don't have that present on ice, then it will always hit the, the star star. That will just increment, and it's the bulk of your traffic. CPU originated traffic and things like that, they also zero, zero, and also be accounting there. So the only thing that we download as well is the, the groups that we actually have information for. So we have here the groups 0 and 4. They are present. We don't have 212. There's no client 212 being downloaded. If you look at different devices in your network, that might also mean if you look at the show CTS role-based counters, the information between the two devices might not match. This one does have a client in group 4. It downloads the information in group 4. The other client might only have 12. He downloads the information for 12. So that was everything that I had for the presentation today. We also have the Cisco WebEx 
Teams group being set up for the specific sessions. If there are any questions left that you want to answer, we have the Cisco WebEx Teams group. You can just post them there, and we'll try to respond to them as quickly as possible. We also have the, the surveys that you probably have been seeing. You know, every presenter, they need to do the, the survey results afterwards. It will help us a lot getting the information from you back, how good the sessions were, if they were useful, if they're not useful. So if you do have some time after this today, please do fill in the, the session survey information, which will help us to see if the presentation can be announced in any way, and also helps the SGMs that manage the Cisco Live to see if sessions were useful or were not useful. You can also win a, a T-shirt with that, but if you have taken some presentations, I'm sure you're going to get those pretty easy. The service can also be done via the event mobile app or the communication systems around Cisco Live. So to continue your education, there are obviously Cisco Live is almost finished. It's just a few more hours today and then tomorrow morning. There are still some demos in the Cisco Showcase, the walk and self-paced lab that the, the tech guys are doing, MTE meetings and related sessions. The sessions are also videotaped and will be available on Cisco Live cisco.com, I believe, or the website from Cisco Live in about two weeks, so you can review those. The slide deck is also posted in the mobile app, so you can download it and review it. So, thank you everybody for your time. And <laughs>